From the title alone, I'm sure there are already going to be people upset with the suggestion that Warriors has an issue with gender. I'm sure that there are others of you who find the position to be a simple fact that requires no further evidence. For both groups, I ask that you be patient for a while, because this is a touchy and complicated subject and it can't be explored properly in a quick format. But let me first begin with a few general messages and responses to the most obvious and common criticisms to the point as a whole. First of all, I am fully aware that Warriors has female authors. The original editor and ghostwriters were all women, and even though we don't know precisely who the team may consist of now, many of the members that we do know about are women. This is great, but it doesn't change any of the points I will make in this video. Man or woman, kind or callous, it is possible for anyone to put sexist material into the world, either through off-handed phrases or accidental messages in media. I don't believe that any of the Aarons intended to treat she-cats worse than Toms, or to put across any messages about proper gender roles for their readers, and I'm not accusing them of being sexist people. However, the material in their books is what it is, and I will analyze it as such. Secondly, it is absolutely true that it could be worse. Warrior Cats is not the worst scum-of-the-world book series that has made every possible error. She-cats are not treated like objects or servants, and there are plenty of notable and well-loved female characters. This, too, is something I entirely acknowledge, but don't believe is particularly relevant. Just because sexism, or anything for that matter, could be worse, doesn't mean that it isn't still worthy of critique for the faults it does have. As I will do my best to show, there is an issue with how the series at large handles their female characters, and I ask that you wait and listen for a short while so that I have time to prove that point. Lastly, for any of you who may already agree with me, or those who may be convinced by this video, I'd just like to give a preemptive warning that none of this gives reason to harass anyone on the team for what they have written or edited. Insults, swears, death threats, and the like will never be a tolerable or warranted response to writing. This analysis is not a condemnation of the series or the people behind it. It is just meant to show what gender balances exist in the series and explain why that matters. With this out of the way, let me explain. Sexism in Warriors isn't always overt, and doesn't show up in precisely the way it might in our world. The Warrior clans don't make open distinctions between she-cats and toms in the way that we constantly distinguish between men and women. In the world of the series, both she-cats and toms are allowed to be warriors and medicine cats, deputies and leaders, without even the idea that some particular rank is locked to a certain gender. With the exception of queens, but we'll get back to that later. However, even though the characters don't often acknowledge it, there are disparities in the way She-Cats and Tom characters are treated, in the narrative and framing of the stories, the plotlines and personalities they are given, and the level of attention they get in comparison to their male companions. It is here where the inclinations and biases writers have from our world seep into Warriors, in a much more obscured way than it would be if, say, Darkstripe said Sandpaw would never make it to Warrior status because she's just a girl, and this was played seriously. Generally, when writing my videos, I try to keep my points concise and trim down the amount I choose to talk about so that it will approximately resemble the lengths of my other videos. However, this isn't an approach I could use for the subject of gender, precisely because it's not an overt subject. No one scene or example I could point to would properly explain the issues that have been building over the past couple of decades, which is why I need to show you, in mass, the differing treatments she cats and toms have received over the series, giving the whole picture for you to judge. I think the best way to begin this discussion is with the most basic and easy-to-comprehend avenue, statistics. By taking numbers straight from the books without much, if any, explanation, I hope to show you the breadth of evidence for you to see and judge on your own, before I offer my own thoughts on the subject. Keep in mind that for all of these, I am working with numbers from Before a Starless Clan, Exile from Shadow Clan, and One Star's Confession. As I am writing, none of these books have come out, and this particular video will take too long to produce for me to retroactively include any new information when a new work releases. Even if I did have the first A Starless Clan book, though, I would rather only include complete arcs in a rundown like this, as character arcs and screen time balances have often varied wildly across different books and past arcs. Over the course of the main series, and even including Flametail and Feathertail, who each got less than five chapters in the spotlight, there have been 12 Tom point-of-view characters and 9 She-Cat point-of-view characters. There have, in fact, been two arcs with nothing but Tom point-of-view characters, and no arcs where only She-Cats were in focus. For the Super Editions, there have been 8 Tom protagonists, soon to be 9 and then 10 when One Star and River Star's Super Editions release, and only 6 She-Cats. Technically even less, since Stick, a Tom, was the point-of-view for 5 of the 35 chapters in SkyClan's Destiny, which is otherwise a Leafstar book. 
The novellas are the only type of book that tips in the other direction, with 12 stories going to she-cats and 9 going to toms. Though it's worth pointing out that these are the shortest form of material in the series, so these she-cats didn't have much time to develop, something that will become important later in different types of statistics. In the mangas, if we count all of the shorter three-part books as one book each, four, soon to be five when Exile of Shadowclan comes out, of the comics have Tom points of view, while three are from she-cats. And one of these is the rather unfortunate Tiger Star and Sasha series. With the exception of novellas, where the she-cats pull ahead, it seems like the Tom characters are, on the whole, always given more spotlight. But just counting who the main character of certain books are isn't enough to prove that. Maybe if you look at the chapters they got, the lines they, or any character, gets to say, or even the number of words they get, the stats will come out differently. So let's try that. Beginning with the largest metric, here is a ranked list of the numbers of chapters every character gets in their point of view over the course of the main series. You may notice that all of the top five cats are toms, and only two of the top ten are she-cats. In total, the toms have been points of view for 731 chapters, while the she-cats have had 326 chapters in the spotlight, less than 45% of the toms total. But just in case that isn't evidence enough, let's add in points of view from the super editions and novellas, including every type of content that has chapters at all. The top five are still all toms, though with the addition of super editions, there are now a whole three cats in the top ten. The toms have had 1,036 total chapters, taking into account all of this material, while the she-cats have had 600, still less than 58% of what the toms get. And, if you're curious, even taking out the main series numbers and including only the chapters from the super editions and novellas, the she-cats still fall behind by 31 chapters. Even going by the more specific metric of line counts, counting each time that a protagonist speaks in their arc, it doesn't look much better. This is the ranked list of lines that each point of view character has within their own arc, whether or not it was during their chapter. Because I was dividing it this way, Jayfeather and Lionblaze each got split up into two numbers, one for their lines in Power of Three and the other for their lines in Omen of the Stars. Immediately, you can see a variety of changes from the chapter list. Clear Sky is a great deal higher, from 17th place to 10th, on account of how much he speaks in other cats' chapters. Meanwhile, Leafpool has dropped from 6th place to 15th, because even though she's the only New Prophecy protagonist to have a point of view in each book, she doesn't have a substantial role in any of those books, and mainly serves as a camera to watch as everyone else speaks. But one thing that hasn't changed is the gender disparity. Even if you count a top six instead of a top five, to account for both Jayfeather numbers landing top spots, there still isn't a single she-cat in the top six, and there are only two in the top eleven. In total, the Toms have 23,055 lines, while the she-cats have only 11,212 lines, less than 49% of the Toms count. It would seem, from this data, that the authors on the whole spend less time with their she-cats than their Toms. But perhaps even line counts aren't specific enough to prove that idea. A single line could be someone crying, Hello! As easily as it could be an entire page-long speech where a cat expresses their deepest feelings and makes a choice of epic proportions. Let's now explore the idea of word counts, a measure of how many words come through the perspective of a certain point-of-view character. Even if they are a camera, a character having pages upon pages of thinking about what their clanmates do is being given attention of some sort. With that in mind, here are the ranked word counts for all of the main series protagonists. You may note that the top three here are still all Toms, and only three of the top ten are She-Cats. Of those three, our biggest resident camera, Leafpool, and Bristlefrost, who ranked 13th in line count and 11th in chapter count, implying a lot of camera behavior on her part as well, are the highest characters, taking 4th and 5th place respectively. Hollyleaf is the next she-cat, and she only ranks 9th here. And even with the three she-cats in the top ten, the overall totals still suffered. Tom's had a total of 2,022,087 words, where she-cats only had 947,166 words, less than 47% of what the Toms get. The super edition and novella calculations don't show a gender problem in the line and word counts, though, because with their protagonists as the only protagonists for the whole story, they end up having fluctuating counts based solely on the standards for the appropriate book lengths, decided by the errands, as they ebb and flow over time. Almost all of the highest numbers, middle numbers, and bottom numbers in this list come from the same time period, and or are the same type of book, biography of a character, telling of an important event, etc. These numbers aren't determined at all by the importance authors assign to a character. 
But here they are anyway, in case you happen to be interested. The fact remains, though, that when it is possible for the authors to pay more attention to one character than another, they consistently choose to put more emphasis on even their less interesting Toms before their she-cats. These types of disparities between Tom and she-cat perspectives wouldn't be all that bad if it was just a few books or an arc, but this is averaged across the entire series, and as you saw in the breakdowns across books, it's a problem that permeates each type of material all across Warrior's history. One might argue, though, that this just has to do with the point of view cats, a relatively small sample among the thousand-plus number of cats in the series, and that would be a fair point to make. I am not capable of counting or listing the lines of every Tom and She-Cat in the series, but I do have two workarounds. Firstly, here is the list of the top 30 cats in the series, sorted by line count, entirely separated from who might be a point-of-view character at any given moment. The top 10 of this list includes only three She-Cats, and the entire list includes only 13. The total number of Tom lines here is 43,821, while She-Cats have 26,805 lines, about 61% of the Tom's total. Hearing that, you may think, Oh great! Finally the percentage crept over the 50s! Which is a fine reaction to this. It's good that, taking every book into consideration, and a wider cast of characters than just the protagonists, the line counts evened out to some degree. But what would actually make the numbers even is if the she-cats had about 100% of the toms total. In other words, the same. 61% is still less than two-thirds of what the toms have, and I've struggled through every avenue of measure to even find a way where the she-cats come out this well. But I do have one last method to give us a better idea of the gender splits, even across characters who get less than 10 lines. And it's one that I am quite familiar with at this point, as I've used it and will keep using it for every episode of Trip Through Time. In each book with identifiable characters, so main series entries, super editions, and novellas, I rank the characters who speak by the number of lines they have, and determine, first, the percentage of speaking characters who are she-cats, and second, the percentage of the total lines in the book that are said by she-cats rather than toms. Both of these statistics were rather enlightening for me. I'll first discuss the cast themselves. Ignoring how much they speak, here is the list of books that have the most and least she-cats in their speaking casts. The percentages here stand for how much of the cast is made up of she-cats. You may note that Hollyleaf's Story, Daisy's Kin, Leafpool's Wish, Tawny Pelt's Clan, and Mothwing's Secret are all novellas, which always have smaller casts thanks to their short lengths, with female points of view. Tree's Roots does have a Tom point of view, but it was all about the sisters, a group almost entirely composed of she-cats. The oddity here is The Sun Trail, the first book of Dawn of the Clans. This book only has Greywing, a Tom, as the point of view, and many noteworthy characters like Clear Sky, Jagged Peak, and Shaded Moss are Toms as well. However, since this list doesn't measure the number of lines any involved she-cats have, the brand new and overall balanced cast manages to shine through. However, in addition to the seven listed here, there are only 11 other books where 50% or more of the cast are she-cats, in a sample size of 77 stories, and not one of the super editions has ever had a cast with more than 47% she-cats. On the other hand, the books with the least she-cats become significantly less balanced, with even the tied fifth places of Long Shadows and A Light in the Mist having only 37% she-cats, and therefore 63% toms, already 6% more than even the most she-cat-heavy books in the series. And where the list of books with the most she-cats contains six novellas and one main series book, the list of books with the least she-cats has two novellas, four main series books, and two super editions, covering every type of material I was measuring. Having a lot of she-cats may be a rarity, most often found in books that already have small casts and she-cat leads, but having a lot of toms is just the norm. And if I move to the line percentages she-cats get across the series, this pattern becomes even worse. Here is the list for reference. In addition to the seven books listed here as having the highest percentage of she-cat lines, there are only seven other books in the series that have 50% or more of the lines given to she-cats. That's only 14 out of 77 books that give equal or more attention to the she-cats than to Tom's. And here, even Into the Wild, which takes the number five spot on having the least she-cat lines, gives 26% of the lines to she-cats, meaning 74% of the lines went to Tom's, which is more than even Squirrel Flight's Hope, a super edition with a she-cat protagonist dealing heavily with an all-she-cat group the sisters could manage to get for their she-cat line percentage. Crowfeather's Trial, the worst in this list, gave a whopping 83% of its lines to Tom's. 
The numbers don't lie. Any way you decide to look at or judge Warrior's metrics, she-cats come out on the losing side. Statistically, and in the most objective way I could manage, she-cat characters are simply given less attention, less presence, and less relevance than Tom characters. And not by a small margin, either. However, numbers aren't everything. They can't tell you what stories she-cats are given in the screen time that they do get, or what messages may come from their characterizations. For that, I will need to look into more specific character and story trends, and later, get into some examples with particular characters. I mentioned that we've never had an arc with all female protagonists, but even in the cases where there have been two female protagonists, they've always had a similar type of relationship and story, being sisters. Leafpool and Squirrelflight, Dovewing and Ivypool, and Violetshine and Twigbranch all fit this model, and the latter two cases especially seem to parallel each other very closely. Dovewing and Twigbranch were both well-meaning, open, kind cats who wanted to reach out to their sisters but had external circumstances that drew them away, while Ivypool and Violetshine were both jealous, hostile cats who grew up in less than favorable environments and grew to hate their sisters for how they weren't able to spend all of their time with them. And both even ended up being part of and spies against the villain groups for their arcs, feeding information back to the heroes. Meanwhile, the Toms have Firestar, who was the only protagonist for his arc, Brambleclaw and Stormfur, who had no relation at all, Jayfeather and Lionblaze, who, despite being brothers, were more defined as a group of three with Hollyleaf or Dovewing, as well as by their individual personalities and journeys, Greywing, Thunder, and Clearsky, who were not only two brothers, but also their son, and Shadowside and Rootspring, who, again, had no relation at all. Thankfully, the newest arc is finally breaking that trend with Frostpawn Sunbeam, two she-cat protagonists who have nothing at all to do with each other. But having over 19 years where that pattern was never broken still isn't great. Across the whole series, there is also an issue in the variety of personalities and archetypes the she-cats tend to get. Now, obviously, there are several specific she-cats I, and I'm sure you can think of, who are bold, strong, and or outspoken, and most often, these are she-cats who have the greatest focus in the narrative. Sandstorm, Yellowfang, and Blue Star in the first arc, Squirrelflight in the second, Hollyleaf in the third, Ivypool in the fourth, Tall Shadow and Windrunner in the fifth, Needletail, Violetshine, and Sleekwhisker to an extent in the sixth, casually skip over the Broken Code, and a couple other disparate cats like Mapleshade and Leopardstar. However, despite these examples, the vast majority of she-cats in the series fall into fairly stock characterizations, being kind, polite, cooperative, motherly if they are the right age, and either bubbly and ditzy or soft-spoken and submissive. Leafpool, Dovewing, Twigbranch, Cinderheart, Bristlefrost, Spottedleaf, Daisy, Willowshine, Turtletail, Pebbleshine, Brightheart, Storm, Sorreltail, Heathertail, Willowpelt, Mothflight, Halfmoon, Feathertail, Millie, Cherryfall, Whitewing, Slate, Tawnypelt, Poppyfrost, Quiet Rain, Brook, Silverstream, Rosepetal, Starflower, Hazeltail, Ferncloud, Icecloud, Sunfish, Sedge Creek, Princess, Brightstream, Honeyfern, Brindleface, and many. Many more she-cats fit into this archetype at some, if not all, times. Now let me be clear that I absolutely love many of these characters. For some, it's because they had moments where they were allowed out of the archetype to add in depth or interest, and for others, it is because I have personally added more characterization than they had before for the sake of my own stories. But all of them, within canon, end up falling into the same stereotypical personality types that women are often expected to have. There is an underlying belief behind this trend that most, though not all, women don't have much value to add in conversations or skill challenges, and because of this, they are either quiet and submissive because they know their place, or energetic and ditzy because they're stupid and haven't learned to let smarter and stronger people take the lead. The number of strong-willed, intelligent, outspoken, and assertive she-cats and warriors is very limited, especially when you start looking at more supportive and background cats, which feeds into those underlying beliefs, even though it is almost certainly unintentional. Clearly the few she-cats who do happen to be magically stronger and more opinionated than the rest would end up in focus, but the rest of the she-cats should stand aside. And, especially in the case of those more minor characters, that's often what happens, and the most basic aspects of the stereotype, nice, caring, stupid, or soft-spoken, becomes all the character they get. 
There is one type of characterization that is especially rare to find for she-cats in the warrior's world, and that is genuine antagonists. The Dark Forest, which is, for lack of a better definition, the bad afterlife for the clans, is an especially gendered place. Of the 19 characters we know to have been sent to the Dark Forest in canon, only Maple Shade and a cat named Sparrowfeather, who was called a Tom for all of the last hope, by the way, are she-cats. If you believe the website family tree and subsequent article, which I patently do not, there are also two other Dark Forest cats, one of which is a she-cat, Frecklewish. And I have my own piece to say on her in a moment. But even outside of the Dark Forest, Rainflower, Sleek Whisker, and Misha are the only other female antagonists in the series. Mapleshade is, of course, the poster child for female warriors villains, primarily because she's the only substantial one we have. But even her evil backstory is about losing her kits, a very female-tied trait. Rainflower, too, is considered evil almost exclusively because of her status as a horrible and abusive mother. Considering her promotion to Star Clan, she likely never did anything wrong to a cat who wasn't Crooked Star, though that is plenty to make her an awful cat and antagonist for Crooked Star's promise. Sleek Whisker and Misha are both pitifully small parts of their stories, and both more often serve as underlings to the true big bad, a Tom who leads their group. And Frecklewish? <sighs> Enough has been said about her truly awful, asinine place in the Dark Forest, and the warped, factually incorrect article written to justify that placement. But I do have a word to add about how this contributes to the problem of gender bias. If I had to wager a guess of why she was even suggested to be in the Dark Forest in the first place, and giving the benefit of the doubt that the original suggester did read and understand Mableshade's vengeance and wasn't just a Mableshade apologist, it may have been to fill some quota of female Dark Forest members, considering other choices like Sleek Whisker and Rainflower weren't dead yet or were confirmed to be in Star Clan. But condemning Frecklewish to the Dark Forest wasn't a good way to do that, especially when other Tom members of her same story who committed far worse crimes, Oakstar and Appledusk, were allowed to go free and be in Star Clan. If I am correct, and the intention was to bring more gender balance to the Dark Forest, there should have been a different approach. Instead of trying to force existing cats into the Dark Forest, there should be an effort made to include more new female villains, going into stories in the future and perhaps creating new characters like Mapleshade, who existed in the clan's past and could still be in the Dark Forest, a place notably lacking in any particularly old characters. With things as they are, rather than evening out the Dark Forest gender ratio, the choice to put Frecklewish in the Dark Forest while letting Oakstar and Appledusk, along with cats who have broken the Warrior Code far more and done far worse deeds from other arcs, keep their previously confirmed places in Star Clan, instead seems to say that she cats can be punished more harshly than Tom's, which only adds to the growing pile of gender disparity in the series. Unfortunately, despite the seeming equality of the warrior's world, with any cat of any gender being allowed into any of the clan roles, looking at the way these roles were divided among different cats through the series tells a different story. The three main, distinct, and relatively exclusive roles are those involved in the leadership of the clan, the leaders, deputies, and medicine cats. Considering that there aren't genetically more Toms born than she-cats, or vice versa, a society that didn't care about gender would have roughly equal numbers of Toms and she-cats in each role, when averaged across the whole history we're aware of, but unfortunately this isn't the case. I've split the following statistics into two groups, one just covering the examples we see somewhere in the main series, and one which includes the total number of cats in a certain role that the clans have ever had, across not only the main series, but also the super editions, novellas, mangas, and field guides. First up is the leaders, which is unfortunately the most tom-leaning of the positions. Over the course of the main series, we have seen 20 different leaders, and only 5 of them, or 25%, were she-cats, while 15 of them were toms. If we expand that to the full series, then 21 of the 82 leaders, or 26%, were she-cats, while 54, or 66% of them were toms, and 7 cats don't have a specified gender. For the deputies, I decided only to count cats who didn't end up becoming or haven't yet become leaders, so as to not have repetitions. In that case, the main series has shown us 27 deputies, 8, or 30% of which were she-cats, with the remaining 19 being toms. Including the supplemental material as well, there are 64 deputies, where 20, or 31% of them are she-cats, and the other 44 are toms. This means that both leadership roles are, on average, given to toms at least two-thirds of the time. But what about the healers and spiritual guides? 
I think that most people, if they consider warriors' roles to be gendered at all, think of the medicine cats as mostly a she-cat-led profession. Unfortunately, while this group does lean more towards she-cats than leaders or deputies, even the medicine cats have more toms among them. In the main series, we've had 21 medicine cats, 8, or 38% of which were she-cats, with the remaining 13 being toms. Expanding that to the full series, there are 55 medicine cats, 23 or 42% of which are she-cats, with one medicine cat of indeterminate gender and the other 31 slots or 56% going to toms. Whether you look at just the main series, supplemental material, or totals, and no matter which role you look at, there are always more toms than she-cats who get elected to these prized roles, and the more exclusive and in-charge a position gets, the fewer she-cats are a part of those positions. There are definitely disparities in what roles are given to what characters, which, even if it's an unconscious addition from the authors, is now a part of the world. The cats and warriors might not consciously trust Toms more than she-cats for leadership, but there's still a bias at work, and gender roles very much do exist, just not in the same configurations as in our world. Leaders and deputies are more often Toms, and while she-cats are allowed to be medicine cats more than anything else, their main role seems to be somewhere else in the expectation that all she-cats should get a mate, have kits, and focus on their family. This category likely has spilt and will continue to spill into the others at times because it is so prevalent, but I would like to spend some time talking about this trend on its own. She-cats are not only expected to, but most often do, have mates and kits. We've seen this societal expectation come up explicitly with Holly Paw's concerns to her mother about the possibility of not having kits, and her mother's dismissal of the subject. A vast majority of the she-cat protagonists end up with a romantic interest and drama involving a mate and or kits, a trend that even manages to include those rare she-cats who are independent and outspoken. Feathertail is one of the cats who fell directly into the bland, stock personality I discussed earlier, with no traits to speak of in her new prophecy appearance outside of being nice, quiet, and submissive compared to her equally stock, strong guy brother. The only character, well, not Arg, but Journey, maybe, that she got was her forbidden love with Crowfeather, and choosing to die to save him along with the tribe. Thankfully, her manga gave us a much more personal and emotional look into her past with RiverClan and Leopard Star especially, and I really do appreciate it for that. But most people will still think of the pretty RiverClan she-cat who was Crowfeather's first love, the cat we knew her as for 15 years when they think of Feathertail, rather than any grudges she might have had against her clan or leader. The majority of Squirrel Flight's life has been based around her maiden kits. Her love triangle with Ashfur and Brambleclaw took up the entirety of the latter half of the new prophecy, and became the foundational scene and drama plotline for Power of Three. Her conflicts with both Toms continued on through the end of Omen of the Stars and the Broken Code, and her relationship with her kits, both her first litter after they found out she lied to them, and her second litter as they went on to have difficulties as a medicine cat and queen, respectively, have taken up a bulk of her story. Even as strong and confident and assertive as she can be, most of her journey has been defined by her romantic and motherly relationships. And her sister isn't all that much better. Leafpaw's early apprenticeship days may have been spent hanging out more with Cinderpelt, Sorreltail, and Mothwing than anyone else, though there may still be a maid in there already, depending on your feelings. But from the period just before she got her name and going into the days after, Sorreltail drew away on account of having her kits, Cinderpelt died, and Mothwing became stuck across the lake and only accessible at gatherings. And Leafpool's primary relationship started up with Crowfeather. They spent at most a couple of weeks together, but it was enough to define not only her story in the new prophecy, but her main relationship for all the succeeding arcs. Jayfeather and Hollyleaf especially, as they were both her apprentices and her kits, and considering Hollyleaf tried to murder her. Dovewing also dealt with a forbidden relationship in Tigerheart, later Tigerstar, and outside of her relationship with her sister, her main plotline through Omen of the Stars and Tigerheart's Shadow, along with pieces of Dovewing's silence and Bramblestar's storm, was how much she was willing to commit to Tigerheart as a partner, and if she was willing to go with a second option of Bumblestripe, a tom that she never particularly loved, but who loved her and actually lived in ThunderClan. Neither love interest was a particularly good or appealing option, and both Toms could be pushy and occasionally manipulative towards her, but one maid or the other were the only choices that were ever presented to her. 
Her main purpose in the recent arc has been as a doting mother to Shadowsight, and now, as of the beginning of the Starless Clan, she has two more kits, Birchkit and Rowankit, named after her and Tiger Heartstar's fathers. Violet Shine, once the kin was defeated, spent the latter half of a vision of shadows finding, standing up for, and loving Tree. Despite an intense lack of chemistry between them and any reason I can see in the text for why Violet Shine is so drawn to him. Violet Shine's role since the Broken Code began has been exclusively as a mother, but Tree was certainly the more important of the parents for giving Root Spring's sister powers and a reputation for oddity, while Violet Shine barely had any presence at all. Bristlefrost began her time as a protagonist by devoting her entire life to Stemleaf, with whom she pictured an idyllic life of the perfect mates and best warriors together in the clan. When that fell through, it seemed for a short time like she would learn to make her own goals and find joy independent of romantic relationships, but instead she became completely devoted to a different Tom, Rootspring, who she ultimately died to protect and thought about in her last moments. At the time I'm writing this, only the excerpt for Forever is available, and if Bristle Frost is any indication, I can't and shouldn't predict or judge a character's entire arc until it's over. So I won't add much about the new protagonists here, but it's worth noting that even in the single chapter we have, Sunbeam, the only one of our Starless Clan protagonists who starts as an adult, already has a committed romantic relationship with Blazefire. If you're from the future, you can tell me in the comments exactly how their relationship works out and if they follow or break existing trends, especially if you happen to come from when a Starless Clan is entirely complete and know exactly what happens over the whole arc. To be clear, though, our main series protagonists aren't the only she-cats who get their arcs centered around mates and kits. Pretty much all of Sasha's character and story has to do with her mate, Tiger Star the First, and their resulting kits, Hawkfrost, Mothwing, and Tadpole. Even her special, dedicated Sasha manga was called Tiger Star and Sasha, not only including her mate's name in the title of the comic where she is the point of view, but putting that name first. And even outside of the comic, every time she has appeared in the series, she was at least talking about, if not to, her mate or kids. One of Blue Star's biggest and most integral life events was dealing with her forbidden love Oakheart and the kits that resulted, Mistyfoot, Stonefur, and Mosskit, the last of whom died as she tried to take them over to Riverclan so she could become deputy. In fact, her death scene was built around these events, as her children finally forgave her for giving them away, and accepted her as their mother. Leafstar was also a cat who had to deal with the problem of simultaneously being a mother and a leader, but in her case, rather than giving them up, she tried to do both jobs. An idea that became much more difficult when her mate, Billy Storm, decides to go behind her back and tell the kids that they will be coming to the two-leg nest with him without even letting Leafstar know. And again, when Sol decides to steal the kits and pretend to find them again to gain Leafstar's sympathies. And then Leafstar is the one who apologizes to Billy Storm because she got angry with him. And Billy Storm apologizes for a hypothetical situation where the kits left to find him, but never apologizes for going behind Leafstar's back in the first place. I'm glad they have this character who even attempts a balance between motherhood and a career, and how difficult that can be, but painting her is in the wrong for finding it bad that her mate went behind her back and told the kids he would be taking them away when he had never been able to take much care of them before, on account of being a daylight warrior, leaves a sour taste. In an even more toxic life, we have Yellowfang. She got stuck with a forbidden and abusive romance, two dead kits, and a living kit who she had to give away and later kill since he was born evil and did many evil things. Wow, that really is just about every sad she-cat trope in the series wrapped into one, isn't it? All she would need now is for a family member to hate her. <laughs> oh, wait, no, all of her family members hate her. She was exiled because they think she murdered kits. Great! So Yellowfang hits the whole jackpot. Mapleshade, of course, built not only the entirety of her life, but all of her afterlife, too, around her forbidden maid and kids. She could see nothing but the perfect, straight path she imagined taking where she and Appledust got together and no one had a problem with their relationship or kids. Obviously, the most important and perfect kids in the forest. In this way, she's sort of a dark mirror of Bristlefrost, which could have had interesting consequences if either of them had ever realized their similarities or even been able to talk outside of the half a day where Mapleshade was working with Ashfur to kill her and every living cat in the Dark Forest. Anyway, Mapleshade was so devoted to this future that when it didn't turn out, she couldn't give up on it, and went instead to take revenge on every cat around who didn't act the way she wanted them to, and in fact continued to punish all of the descendants of those cats after her death. 
Mothflight's life in Super Edition were based so strongly in her romantic relationship with Micah and the kids it created that she ended up being the medicine cat to make the rule that medicine cats aren't allowed to have mates or kits, immediately breaking off another cat's budding relationship because it's just too difficult to manage motherhood alongside caring for the clan as a medicine cat. Spotted Leaf, meanwhile, if her entire main series life being defined by a far-off relationship with Firestar wasn't enough, had her novella where she was taken advantage of romantically by Thistleclaw as a child until she became a medicine cat to run away from him and avoid becoming his mate, or one of his warriors. And whatever character Pebbleshine may have showed off in the early bits of Hawkwing's journey, for her novella, she was a pretty bland she-cat interested only in her maiden kits, with very little personality or unique wills to speak of. Her novella in general seems to be just a wander around various unimportant scenes as Pebbleshine, the protagonist, watched and hoped her kits would be safe and she could get back to Hawkwing. Daisy was in a similar boat, with slightly more personality considering she's an established character already and got to have wills and agency, but her novella, Daisy's Kin, was amazingly enough still focused on her former mate Smokey and the kits and other mates they each had and sometimes lost since they lived together. Now, Daisy is a nursery queen. This sort of plotline for her novella was to be expected, and is welcome as a premise, but we sure are piling up the number of maid and kit-focused plotlines through the she-cat's points of view. For instance, the other she-cat-led novella in the pack with Daisy was Spotfur's Rebellion, which was more a retelling of the broken code from Spotfur's point of view than anything else, with a heavy emphasis on how her relationship with Stemleaf grew. Though they didn't reach this point in the novella, we know from the remainder of the broken code, as well as the allegiances of River, that Spotfur also has three kits, and spends a lot of time grieving her former mate while she's pregnant. I wouldn't be surprised if Mother becomes her main role in the upcoming arc, as many recent cats have been shoved into the background with the simplest versions of the characterizations as soon as they're out of the spotlight. But apparently you can retcon in romance as well. Leopard Star was thought of for a long time to be a case where a she-cat never showed interest in romance or kits. Some people argued that there were romantic underpinnings to her relationship with and manipulation by Tiger Star, but until her Super Edition came out, those were just rumors. Now, rather infamously, Leopard Star has been given a large and unnecessary plot revolving around her love for a tom called Frogleap, who chose not to be her mate because she spent the first couple of days where she was deputy not being with him at every moment. Leopard Star proceeds to regret this choice that she made for the rest of the book and blame herself for choosing career over a mate when she never made a choice to begin with and there shouldn't be a clear-cut choice between love and career. It's not something I can list as a separate point without repeating myself a fair bit, but Warriors also has a large number of situations where Toms in a relationship make a less than optimal choice about the relationship or any kids caught up in it, and it is the she-cat who ends up taking responsibility and blaming themselves and or apologizing. This comes up with Leopard Fur and Frog Leap, Dovewing and Tigerheart, along with Dovewing and Bumblestripe, Leafstar and Billy Storm, Daisy with both of her mates, and also in background cases like the very odd and uncomfortable Brightheart, Cloudtail, and Daisy plotline in the latter half of the new prophecy. This trend can also, if repeated with a single couple, result in some of the more openly abusive relationships like Yellowfang and Ragged Star, Squirrelflight and Brambleclaw, or Sasha and Tigerstar. Even aside from the cats who have a large section of their life and story focused on mates and kits, most she-cat protagonists will still end up with a relationship or litter of kits on the side, as some sort of required completion for their characters. Tawny Pelt didn't get much, if any, focus in what was supposedly her arc, The New Prophecy, but since then, her time in the spotlight, including for the whole of her novella, has been focused on her relationship with Rowanclaw, their kits or their grandkits, one of which ended up saving the day in her novella, even as a kit. Ivy Pool has mostly been relevant since her arc ended in her relationship with Fernsong and their resulting kits, one of whom was Bristlefrost, the Broken Code protagonist, even if she didn't get much time to actually interact with her daughter. For a cat who had managed to avoid having any romantic interests for the entirety of her time as a protagonist, it is especially disappointing that she too fell into a romantic and familiar role as soon as she was out of focus, even if I do like her relationship with Fernsong in concept. Ivy Pool did also get the chance to be Twig Branch's mentor in A Vision of Shadows, but only one of three thanks to Twig Branch's clan hopping. Speaking of Twig Branch, that's another cat who fits into this category thanks to her relationship with Finleap. Her mate's severe issues with boundaries was a large and maddening part of the second half of A Vision of Shadows, but he did agree to back off and they haven't had kits yet as Twig Branch once requested. 
Twigbranch thankfully didn't have the whole of her plot dedicated to a mate, since she also had to decide which clan she should live in and learn to train her apprentice Flatpaw. But as interesting as learning to be a mentor might have been, it wasn't a journey that the authors seemed to care much about, as they skipped over every piece of Twigbranch finding different methods to use and only picked back up to let us know that she's learned to be a mentor now. There's also Misty Star, whose trauma comes about equally from Stonefur's death and those of her kids. Those kids you definitely know, the ones we've never seen, who, even if they stayed alive, never got to develop a personality. But traumatic mothers are easy to write, I suppose? Stepping back from that, I should point out that if you enjoy some or all of the Mater Kit-based plotlines the various protagonists have, that is absolutely fine. I like some of them too. The issue I'm trying to get across isn't that it's bad for plotlines to be centered around mates or kits, but that the majority of all she-cat plotlines are at least heavily involved in mates and kits when they really don't need to be, and when that isn't the case for another group of cats. Across all of the 24 she-cats who have ever had a point-of-view piece in any story, main series, super edition, novella, or comic, there are only three who don't get a mate or kits at some point. Hollyleaf, Tall Shadow, and Mothwing. It's possible to argue this number even lower, since Mothwing as a medicine cat wasn't allowed to have a mate anyway, and Hollyleaf has been said by Kate Carey, as well as in the family tree, to be mates with Fallen Leaves, the cat with whom she spent her entire novella. I don't agree that this relationship exists as a two-way or committed version in the text that we have, and perhaps the numerous examples I have provided show how important it is to me that this one she-cat gets to live without a mate. But the fact remains that Hollyleaf even living her relatively short life without getting a mate is a debatable fact. If you do decide to disqualify Mothwing for being a medicine cat and Hollyleaf for having fallen leaves as a mate, that would leave you with one unequivocally mateless and kitless she-cat point of view in the series. Perhaps to see the contrast, though, we need to look at the stories the Toms get. There have been 29 different main Tom points of view across all the different types of character-led material. Of these, there are 11 different Toms who don't get a mate or kits at all, to the extent that Tall Shadow, Mothwing, and Hollyleaf all fit that category. Jay Feather doesn't have a mate or love interest, unless you count Half Moon, which you might want to, even though they only spend seven chapters with each other over the 12 books of Jay Feather being a point of view. Regardless, his main storylines revolve around him being a medicine cat, and a rather unwilling one, and being one of the three as they tried to defeat the Dark Forest. He spends more time thinking about Flame Tail after the other Tom's death than he does thinking about Half Moon. Speaking of Flame Tail, he never even has an inclination toward love or kits. He instead spends all of his time thinking about how to help his clan and be a good medicine cat, especially with Little Cloud getting old. And later, how much he wants to spite the clans and avoid doing the one thing that could help them reconcile out of petty revenge. I don't like Flame Tail much, but the basic point is that his story never involves a mater kits. Alterheart never has a mater kits as part of his journey either. He did have a very brief flirtation with the kitty pet Velvet, but that relationship never went anywhere, and the vast majority of his story is instead about making something of himself and living up to the ideals placed on him by his parents and Star Clan, along with his effortlessly talented sister. Shadow Sight, too, never had any sort of romance, instead having his story be about learning to deal with the visions he was given from birth and trying to make the right choices as a power-crazed Ashfur, who has taken over Bramblestar's body, does his best to use and manipulate Shadow Sight. And for the last of our medicine cat points of view, Goosefeather also has no mate and never any inkling towards them or kits. In fact, he's pretty awful around kits, if Tiger Kit and Crooked Kit are any indication. Much like Jayfeather, his focus is more on prophecies, though in his case it's because he sees and hears all prophecies all the time, and can't do much, if anything, to affect the world with that knowledge. Now, all of these Toms are medicine cats, so this could disqualify them in the same way that Mothwing could be disqualified. But it is interesting to compare the groups, considering that both the she-cats and Toms have five medicine cat points of view each. With the Tom medicine cats, not one of them has an open forbidden romance or kits, and only two, Jayfeather and Alderheart, even have brief love interest plotlines embedded in small parts of their large and intricate stories. Meanwhile, with the she-cat medicine cats, three of them, Leafpool, Yellowfang, and Mothflight, all have very explicit forbidden romances and kits, and have most of their stories based around those families. And Spotted Leaf, while she never enters into a relationship with the Tom she had interest in, has a life and story about almost nothing but romance, and acts more as an object of beauty and admiration for the Toms than a character of her own. 
Mothwing is the only she-cat medicine cat who doesn't have a love interest. So the double standard still exists, even when an in-universe rule disqualifies medicine cats from having mates or kids. But even if you do believe that all of the medicine cats should be taken out of the running for this category, they aren't, by any stretch of the imagination, the only Tom points of view who aren't based around mates or kids. Tallstar doesn't ever get a canon mate or kids, and his super edition involves absolutely no she-cat love interests at all, and none that are openly declared. Tallstar's revenge revolves mostly around Tallstar finding himself, learning who he is, and journeying away from his clan to track down the cat he blames for his father's death, only to find that revenge wasn't what he needed in the first place, and what he really misses is his home. None of that involves romantic love. There is, of course, Jake, but that's not ever directly stated in the text, and for the purposes of finding points of view that align with the societal standard of needing a maid in kits, secret gay love probably doesn't count. In a similar vein, Ravenpaw also never has a she-cat love interest, and his story is instead about leaving a cat in an environment that was harmful to him, and finding peace and solace somewhere else, with Barley on their farm. Once again, Barley can be very, very easily read as a love interest, but it isn't directly confirmed in the text. It's also worth noting that we've had two very close to being gay protagonists in pretty committed relationships, and the closest we've had to that in She-Cats is Leafpool and Mothwing, who didn't actually get to spend any time together in the same group, always being across the border and then across the lake from each other. And when we briefly saw the relationship from Mothwing's point of view in her novella, she was too distracted with other relationships to give much regard to Leafpool. So without a deep confession of love that we've never gotten, there isn't the certainty that these two cats really love each other, even even in the semi-canon way that Tallstar and Jake or Ravenpaw and Barley have. We also have Redtail, who doesn't ever get a canon mate, and instead has a novella centered around his relationship with Tigerclaw. And despite how flawed and inaccurate the depiction the book gave us was, the fact remains that she, cats, and kits were definitely not involved. Then there's Blackfoot, or Black Star, who never gets a mate or even shows interest in one. His novella was essentially just a retelling of a bunch of events we already knew, with extra shame that he, by all accounts, shouldn't have yet, but it definitely didn't have to do with mates or kids. And Scourge and Mudclaw are in a similar boat. Their villain-esque plotlines had more to do with the cats they were scorned by, Tigerclaw and One Whisker respectively, and their rises to power than with any sort of romance. In fact, neither cat ever even shows an ounce of interest in romance or kits, let alone any particular she-cat. That seven toms who, similar to Tall Shadow, never touch romance, two who have a non-canon gay mate, and two who have extremely brief canon flirtations that never go anywhere. Eleven of twenty-nine toms, or 38% of the total tom protagonists, don't have romance involved in their story. This is a massive step up from she-cats, where, at maximum, three of the twenty-four, or 13% of the she-cat protagonists, don't have romance or kits as a key element in their story. And even looking at the Toms who do have romance as part of their story, there is still a stark difference between their relationships and those of the she-cat protagonists, the number of mates they have. Here is the list of cats in the series who have had multiple confirmed and committed mates. I have omitted cats like Firestar, who never actually got together with his second love interest, Spotted Leaf, and cats like One Star, who, at this moment, only have two mates via author statements or family tree inserts. It is possible that I have missed one, or that more relationships will occur that expand this list in the future, but I have searched for every instance and believe I have come up with a complete list. Though this list has three different categories. First is the group of cats who chose a new mate once their first mate died. Graystripe met and got together with Millie only after Silverstream had been dead for several moons. Barry Nose only even paid attention to Poppy Frost's affection for him once Honeyfern, his first choice in mate, had been killed by a snake. Greywing didn't even meet Slade until after Turtletail died, and Clear Sky actually had three mates, Brightstream, Storm, and Starflower, with each one dying before he moved on to the next. Meanwhile, in the case of the She-Cats, Palebird is the only cat we know of who took a mate, Woollytail, after her first mate, Sandgorse, died. With a total of five dead She-Cat mates that Toms have moved on from, and only one case where a She-Cat moved on from a dead Tom, this gives off the impression that She-Cats are generally more disposable, in comparison to their more interesting Tom mates who could be pulled on emotionally with their death. The second category is cats who moved on after breaking up with their former mate, and in this case, things swing the other way. Crowfeather's first love interest, Feathertail, died before he met up with Leafpool, and he in fact had an entire arc about learning to move on. But then he broke up with Leafpool before becoming mates with Nightcloud. 
and Tigerclaw did get together with Sasha before Goldenflower died, but considering he had been exiled from ThunderClan and only went back for Bramblekid and Tawnykit rather than Goldenflower, it's safe to say that they weren't mates anymore. As far as the She-Cats go, Dovewing thoroughly broke up with Bumblestripe before she went after Tigerheart, and Turtletail left Tom before his death before she returned to Greywing. In both cases, by the way, the She-Cats' final mate is the first one they loved. We then have Clovertail, who got together with Patchfoot, but must have had some previous unnamed mate to have had her first kits with, and Daisy, who broke up with her mates not once, but twice. Poor girl. But that is a total of two Toms, who broke up with their mate and moved on to another, and four She-Cats, implying either that She-Cats get into more bad relationships and more often need to escape them, and or more reinforcement of the idea that She-Cats must have a mate, so even after leaving one, they have to find another. The third category consists of cats who have had multiple mates simultaneously, or almost simultaneously. The list goes as follows. Smokey with Daisy and Floss, though he later has Coriander as well, once Floss passes on. Two ShadowClan cats you've probably never heard of unless you care about the allegiances of Yellowfang's Secret and Blackfoot's Reckoning fit in this category as well. Toadskip was mates with Pool Cloud and Nettlespot, and Blizzardwing was mates with Hollyflower and Featherstorm. Jake also seems to have been mates with Nutmeg and Quince almost simultaneously, without spending much time with either of them. Though, without being able to pin down Scourge's timeline accurately, it's difficult to say how close their kittens were. And perhaps most famously, Appledust took both Mapleshade and Rainshine as mates in rapid succession, though probably not at the very same time. That's five different Toms who get multiple mates in quick succession or simultaneously. Meanwhile, for She-Cats, we have... uh... one. Maybe. It is possible that Moonlight, the leader of the sisters, would fall into this category, with Root and whoever the other fathers of her kids have been. She, much like Jake, doesn't stick around with or care much for any of them. But unlike Jake, Moonlight is actually hated for this, at least by the one mate we get any identification for. Several cats in this category that aren't Jake face negative reputations and or hatred from their mates and kits, but it is interesting to say that the closest comparison Moonlight has to a Tom of her lifestyle isn't ever shown to be hated at all, and is instead always shown and talked about in a very positive light. And of course, the fact that there are five Toms with multiple near-simultaneous mates and only one she-cat makes this start to feel like a double standard, or just a difference in how romance is treated for Toms. These discussions may seem pointless, but there are real and harmful truths in the trends of story arcs across the genders that were necessary to point out. Obviously not every she-cat is a vapid romantic who has no thoughts beyond the health of her mate and the possibility of kids, and not every Tom is a hardened and intelligent warrior who only gives a passing thought to family to fuel his strength in battle. But the she-cat stories are, overall, more focused on romance and exclusivity, where Toms are more often allowed to explore, both to other mates and to their own personal ambitions. Even if this isn't something a reader systematically checks for as they read each new story, it can be subconsciously internalized that she-cats, and by parallel, women, are just the sort of people who more often do, and even should, care about their family more than any other aspect of their life, which might dissuade them from considering what they want in their own life, if they believe it goes against some expectation. There are two particular arcs that have an especially hard time including she-cats and treating them well, and they're arcs that tend to otherwise be pretty beloved, the original arc and Dawn of the Clans. And while both of these arcs have serious issues with the way they handle their she-cat casts, it is in two very different ways. The first arc, which has since come to be known as The Prophecies Begin, simply didn't have many she-cats, and especially not many who played any sizable role in the plot. Over the whole arc, an average of 34% of their cast was she-cats, and they got 30% of the lines. A slight difference, but approximately the same small number, and a sign that there just wasn't a wide she-cat cast to use in the first place. In general, the original arc wasn't great at utilizing its cast especially well, leaning more on its top 10 or even 5 cats than any other arc or book in the series, even surpassing some of the novellas, which barely have time to establish any cast at all. Maybe then it shouldn't be surprising that, with the Tom Fireheart as the protagonist, the She-Cats consistently end up with a small percentage of the lines. But there is a wider issue, 
I covered part of this in my video on The Prophecies Begin, but even if you were to ignore Fireheart, the majority of the cast is always Toms, and they consistently get more lines, along with more characterization and story presence, than the She-Cats. Where the Toms like Longtail, Whitestorm, Bramblepaw, Tallstar, Scourge, Stonefur, Swiftpaw, and Snowkit all get very distinct and unique characterizations, despite their small or practically non-existent times in the narrative, the vast majority of She-Cats have little to no personality. All of the queens end up with similar stock characterizations, and so little care in the narrative that the books didn't even bother to tell us who mothered any of the kits until Ashkit and Fernkit were made apprentices in Rising Storm, and Bramblekit, Tawnykit, and Snowkit were the very first kits to be mentioned by name as kids in the same book. Willow Pelt and Mousefur were the only She Cat warriors until Sandstorm was promoted in Late Fire and Ice, and Willow Pelt was rather swiftly shoved into the nursery as well to be another stock queen. Even with the few She-Cats that do get intricate personalities and stories, many of them are glossed over. Sandstorm's enemy side of the Enemies to Lovers conversion is told in only a couple of scenes, with only a few cursory glances dedicated to her redemption of sorts before she becomes Fireheart's wingman, only there to be his friend as a replacement for Greystripe and discuss all of the horrible problems Fireheart must be going through rather than anything happening in her own life. Brightheart's powerful story about learning to be strong and forge a new journey as a warrior after she made a bad decision to go after the dogs is overshadowed by Toms on both ends, with Swiftpaw getting most of the credit for racing after the dogs, and Cloudtail taking both the screen time and credit for helping Brightheart to heal and develop her own new battle moves. Goldenflower gives the job of telling her kits about their father, Tigerstar, to Fireheart instead of doing the job herself, which could have been, and maybe should have been, a defining moment for her character and story. And her daughter, Tawnypaw, has her entire story about being discriminated against by the clan and leaving to join her father told secondhand by Toms instead of getting to say anything herself. Aside from that, as in some cases I mentioned previously, there are a lot of she-cats whose entire stories and even personalities revolve around little more than a relationship to a tom, whether they be a mate, friend, brother, or kit, such as Speckletail, Silverstream, Spotted Leaf, Princess, Mistyfoot, Yellowfang, and Bluestar. Dawn of the Clans also has a serious problem with she-cats, but with a very different situation. Unlike the original arc, Dawn of the Clans did make a sizable portion of its cast she-cats, with an average of 48% she-cats instead of toms over the arc. Yet this fairly wide body of she-cats only got an average of 29% of the lines, even less than the first arc and almost 20% less than their she-cat cast size would suggest. Part of this is due to the three tom protagonists having a lot of attention, but many of the she-cats in this arc are also what I might bluntly call disposable. This arc has more dead mates than any other, with Greywing losing Turtletail before he ended up with Slate, Thunder technically losing Starflower before he found Violet Dawn, and Clear Sky losing both Brightstream and Storm before he got together with Starflower. Even before all these she-cats died, the number of romance triangles they were involved in gave them little room to have much personality or agency on their own. Greywing and Clear Sky both loved Brightstream and Storm, Greywing and Tom both well, at least pursued Turtletail, and Thunder and Clear Sky both loved Starflower. Slade and Violet Dawn were the only ones to just end up with their final mate immediately upon getting into the plot, but they also both ended up with the least personality, and seem ultimately like perfunctory additions just to make sure that Greywing and Thunder don't end up single when the arc is over. Dawn of the Clans does have a few notable and admirable she-cats. Tall Shadow and Windrunner, of course, Quiet Rain, Turtletail, and Half Moon, now Stoneteller. But rendering so many of the she-cats into objects to be fought over or won as prizes for the toms leaves a sour taste, especially considering how many of their stories ended with brutal deaths to cause toms pain. Even where the she-cats get the same opportunities or story threads as toms, the ways that their stories are treated or resolved are different in a worrying trend. I won't and couldn't provide every possible parallel, but the four I've chosen include prominent characters and are particularly striking to me. Firstly, we have to contend with Bluefur and Whitestorm. Both had kits of a similar age in the nursery when they were considered for the position of deputy. Bluefur had Mistykit, Stonekit, and Mosskit, and Whitestorm had Sorrelkit, Rainkit, and Sootkit. However, in Bluefur's case, having kits meant being stuck in the nursery and, apparently, not being appointed deputy. While for Whitestorm, him being a father didn't even occur to Firestar as a point of interest when he was thinking about who to make deputy. 
You could argue that Bluefur, as her kit's sole parent, had more responsibility than Whitestorm or Willow Pelt individually, and as such needed to spend the time with her kits. But Whitestorm didn't visit the nursery much at all, and it certainly never once interfered with his duties. It seems like being a father and a deputy is considered easy, as it is never even brought up that he might have a conflict. If Bluefur was as strong of a warrior as we know her to be, and the previous leader did consider her to be the better choice over Thistleclaw when she was preoccupied with grieving her kits, then surely it wouldn't be a stretch for Bluefur to be made deputy while taking care of the kits, and have other queens and senior warriors help her with different parts of her duties until she was ready to to fully take on the role. And it is never even suggested by anyone that Thrushpelt, the presumed and affectionate father of these kits, takes some of Bluefur's work off her paws so she can accept a rare and special career opportunity. I'd now like to go over Yellowfang and Crowfeather, who you might not have thought to compare to each other before. But both cats are snappy, had forbidden relationships, were scorned by their clans at different points for those relationships, and each had a son who did horrible things. Broken Star, as ShadowClan's leader, pushed kits too hard and got them killed, drove WindClan away, and made ShadowClan a horrific place to live. Breezepelt, who trained under him in the Dark Forest, by the way, never rose to the level of power that Broken Star did, but still tracked down a pregnant queen and a medicine cat to attack and attempt to kill them at the moon pool, relished in the violence the Dark Forest provided him, attacked and enjoyed attacking his own clan during the final battle, gloated as he stood over Hollyleaf's body, and prepared to kill Lionblaze too, and did not regret his actions when the time came to dole out punishments. Before Crowfeather's trial reinvented who Breezepelt was and everything that he had done, Yellowfang and Crowfeather both had sons who had done several undeniably bad things. But in Yellowfang's case, she bears a great deal of the weight for his misdeeds, and believes through to her death that Broken Star is her own responsibility, and her own punishment, even though she was completely torn from him by being exiled and keeping in mind how she had very little effect in his life or choices, seeing as she decided not to raise him. Meanwhile, Crowfeather, whose choices are at least more related to Breezepelt's bad behavior than Yellowfang's were to Broken Star, is able to wash himself of the blame almost entirely and reprimand Breezepelt for all the horrible things he has done that Crowfeather never pushed him to do. For a closer connection, how about we compare Fireheart and his daughter Squirrelflight? I am certain that I'm not the first one to have made this connection, but both cats are independent, determined, morally driven warriors of ThunderClan who have both disobeyed their leaders to do what their hearts told them was right. However, they faced very different treatments. When Fireheart had to stand up to an ailing Blue Star who was making rash decisions by preventing her from attacking WindClan, the clan stood behind him, even though Fireheart didn't come to them at first and helped him to prevent a war. But when Squirrelflight was faced with a similar, and perhaps even worse and more clear-cut situation, trying to step up as leader when Bramblestar was confirmed to be entirely absent thanks to Ashford taking his body, the clan fought against her at each step, declaring that because she hadn't gotten nine lives, she wasn't fit to lead them at all. When the clan was perfectly happy to follow Lionblaze in his anger against Ashford and Shadowsight, and later Greystripe as well when he returned from abandoning Squirrelflight and ThunderClan as such a wonderful, wise, skilled Tom and a natural natural leader who was the narration's darling for the rest of the book. Looking at the treatment Fireheart and even Lionblaze and Greystripe received in comparison to what Squirrelflight went through, it starts to look like the clan has a double standard, or didn't have a problem with StarClan chosen cats at all, but instead they just didn't want to follow Squirrelflight specifically. Even when we are dealing with StarClan chosen leaders though, similar disparities pop up. Take a comparison between Leafstar and Bramblestar. In SkyClan's Destiny and Squirrelflight's Hope, the deputies Sharpclaw and Squirrelflight each went behind their leader's backs to take actions that they believed needed to be taken and that the leader wouldn't agree to. Sharpclaw rallied a group of warriors together to help a group of cats they were sheltering take back their home from invading rogues, and Squirrelflight got to know and tried to make peace with the sisters, even as Bramblestar and the other clans wanted to drive them out. Sharpclaw is arguably less justified in doing this from the offset, since he is choosing to involve himself and other warriors in a matter completely unrelated to his clan, taking sides in a two-leg place fight, and never coming to Leafstar with this information, even when, considering she is sheltering the very cats he wants to protect, she would probably at least have given it serious thought. Not to mention the fact that even when Leafstar does catch him, he still lies about their intentions. 
Squirrel Flight, meanwhile, was aware from the beginning that Bramblestar didn't like helping the sisters since Squirrel Flight had made the suggestion instead of him, so she knows she wouldn't get far if she tried asking him directly. The matter with the sisters also heavily involves the clans, as they are currently living on land that the clans would like to give to Sky Clan to solve their territory disputes, and she has the benefit of fighting for categorically good things to protect, a pregnant queen and a cat who is currently dying. But even imagining that Sharp Claw and Squirrel Flight situations are perfectly equivalent, their treatment is still different. Leaf Star is expected to, and does, forgive Sharp Claw almost immediately for his behavior, while Squirrel Flight is continuously punished by Bramble Star. It takes Squirrel Flight dying for him to regret anything, and even then he tries to summarize the situation by saying they both messed up. It's also worth noting that, much like with Bluefur and Whitestorm, both Leafstar and Bramblestar had a litter of kits while they were leaders. But Bramblestar's fatherhood was barely a background element, and Leafstar's motherhood was so strenuous that she had to have an entire arc about fighting for her right to be a leader and a mother, and her difficulty in doing so. I don't blame the characters for all of this, and in some of these cases, I don't even blame the characters at all. The issue comes in the framing, the choices the authors and editors have made to treat she-cats and toms differently, even when they're in the same situation. It's a double standard, plain and simple, and with the number of examples like these, where the she-cat is continuously treated worse, more at fault, or in more of a burden position than the tom, it stops feeling like a matter of just slightly altering old plots to make them new and fresh, and starts feeling like underlying bias against she-cats. To be clear, though, it isn't just the she-cats who are disadvantaged in this arrangement. The Tom characters suffer as well, as they are also often forced into certain gender roles based on our world's assumptions about masculinity. For one, they aren't allowed much diversity in body types. Warriors, in general, isn't great about describing their characters beyond pelt and maybe eye color, with the occasional mention that a she-cat is beautiful. But a large group of the Toms, when they do get descriptions, are called muscular, broad-shouldered, and or strong. More basic background toms like White Storm, Brackenfur, or Oakheart, protagonists like Firestar, Bramblestar, and Lionblaze, and of course villains like Broken Star, Tiger Star, and the Tiger Clones, Darktail, and even Soul are all praised for their physical strength, strong stature, and stoic attitudes, which can, as some examples may imply, also lead into the big bad antagonist role that she cats are almost never allowed to fulfill. You might think Scourge is an exception, as he is a very small and lithe cat, but he has such strength and power that he can take nine lives away in a single strike, so his physical size becomes rather irrelevant. The true exceptions are, of course, Jayfeather, who is explicitly smaller and thinner than his littermates and is made to become a medicine cat, and Ravenpaw and Alderheart, who were both anxious and less successful in some areas than their clanmates, and who both had to abandon their apprenticeships, either to medicine cat training or to the barn. But the fact that we can even pull out these three specific examples is already an indication of how ingrained these tropes are in the hundreds and hundreds of other tomcats across the series. You could also include Thrushpelt in this category. While he is a strong, capable, and respected warrior, he has the unique trait of not getting ridiculously angry when a she-cat he liked didn't like him. And I discussed this far more in depth in my video on Thrushpelt, but it really shouldn't be so uncommon for Toms to accept rejection that Thrushpelt stands out as our one example of a functional and compassionate Tom, who wants friendship with Bluefur even if he can't have her as a mate. Thrushpelt is great, but he really should not be our only example to turn to in this field. More than body type or personality diversity, though, Toms are also given a gender role that is the other side of the coin to she-cats so often being forced to pay more attention to their families than careers or identities. Toms are actually more often prevented from being involved in their kids' lives. An especially wonderful father may visit their children a few times in the nursery, or even speak with them once or twice when their apprentices are warriors, but a lot of other Toms who are still considered fine or even good within the warrior's world will practically or literally abandon their kids, not have any sort of emotional openness with them, or just be entirely absent for crucial parts of their kids' lives. And beyond them, there are plenty of other bad father figures who do explicitly abandon or ignore their kids. Yet again, though, there is an exception, to some extent, Fernsong. He's a Tom who at least spoke to the idea that he would take over Ivy Pool's duties in the nursery and care for kits. But this isn't something we have seen much from him in the text, even when one of his kits spent a whole arc as a point-of-view character. And he hasn't actually moved in to be a den dad. It sure would be nice to have some more focus on that background character, to give him some follow-up on all his nice-sounding promises, but he still is the best we have at the moment. 
And even as he does break the stereotype to an extent, let us also remember that he was named after a she-cat, another permanent queen with a traditionally feminine name, which may have altered the author's perceptions for him. The Toms don't benefit from gender roles either, robbed of the opportunities at large to hold larger parts in their families' lives and to have a wider variety of personalities and strengths, both levels and types. This system doesn't actually help anyone. Well, any cat. Now, I should also address the elephant in the room that is the sisters, the only group we have seen who explicitly distinguishes between and treats differently cats who are toms as opposed to she-cats. For anyone who might not be aware of who they are, let me give you a brief rundown. We first learned about the sisters in Squirrel Flight's Hope, and they acted primarily as the victims of the story, antagonized by the warring clans who wanted to take their land as quickly as possible while Moonlight, the leader of the sisters, was pregnant, solely because they wanted Sky Clan to get that land so the other clans could have their own territories back, approximately to the way it was before Sky Clan came to the lake in A Vision of Shadows. Later, we got to see them again in Tree's Roots, a novella that told Tree's backstory as one of the sisters who didn't have the magic earth connections that the other Toms did, and who lost his would-be traveling companions soon before he was forced to leave. They once again returned in sections of the Broken Code, choosing to go back and help the clans that antagonized them, at Rootspring's request, by summoning some of the ghosts that had been taken over by Ashfur, and helping Spotfur ready herself for the kits she would soon have and also Daisy's kin to take care of Smokey and Coriander's kits after the latter died in childbirth. In all of their appearances, it is clear that they are a she-cat-run society. Many of the she-cats have little regard for their mates and sons, except that they should fulfill their roles, helping new kits to be born and traveling off to guard the earth, respectively. Whatever else you may say about them, the sisters are definitely sexist, in the opposite way as I've been talking about for the whole preceding video. So why isn't this a problem? Why didn't I bring it up earlier? Well, it's because this sexism is directly addressed in the text. Each time they are brought up, and through Squirrel Flight and Tree's perspectives especially, the narration lets us know that this is strange and wrong. It forces cats into roles they don't always want, and diminishes the respect that cats have for each other, relegating Toms to be, all in all, much less complex and less fondly looked upon than the she-cats. It is entirely possible that some cats take Toms more seriously than others, or at least use less active aggression and dismissal towards them but the way their society works is still unbalanced and firmly painted as wrong, even though the sisters not only can be, but often are, a strong, interesting, and helpful group. What I'm critiquing in this video is the impressions of gender that the books give to readers, and by explicitly and repeatedly showing how wrong the sisters are for this, it avoids giving the idea to a reader that sexism against men is in any way a good thing. I hope the evidence and explanation I've given is sufficient enough to prove that Warriors as a series does have issues with the way it handles gender. Even if one piece of evidence wasn't striking enough, or if you have a counter-argument you would like to offer to one of my points, the body of evidence is vast and, for me, rather convincing. The problem from my point of view comes not from arguing over segmented cases, but considering what to do with the series as a whole, knowing it has these problems. Unlike most other topics I have discussed or even could discuss on this channel, the topic of gender doesn't exist in a bubble. It is heavily influenced by the authors and editors behind the books and the underlying unconscious biases that still exist in our world today. It may be entirely true that, if the world of the clans were to exist as its own, separate entity, there wouldn't be any gender biases at all. Maybe she-cats and toms could be equally as likely to become leaders, heroes, or permanent caretakers for the nursery. But Warriors is a work of fiction created by people from our world, and it reflects problems that we still have in our own society. This isn't a problem exclusive to Warriors, of course. Without explicitly going in to look at trends across your own work and taking care to add in equal opportunities and positive messages for gender equality, any writer and any world can fall into issues like the ones I've described in this video. But the fact that a problem is widespread or even popular doesn't stop it from being a problem. In fact, it makes it more important to address. Fiction is one of the earliest and most pervasive methods of exposure to different ideas, worlds, and types of people that children will get. And because of that, it's important to give serious thought to what you do with the space a book gives you, especially once you consider readers who do fit into more marginalized demographics. Consumers of any media often want to be able to see themselves in the characters and their struggles, so they can feel a kinship with the world they are reading about, see new ways to approach similar problems that they might have had in their own life, or just know they aren't alone in being part of a particular demographic, or in wanting, feeling, or thinking certain things. 
This is the most general reason why representation can be important. Many people want canonical gay ships in Warriors and other media they follow, not because it's intrinsically important to see two toms butting their heads against each other affectionately, but because the inclusion of a completely confirmed gay pairing would give readers, both gay and not, a way to see gay individuals as normal and an accepted part of their favorite world. Similarly, it's important to give she-cats equal roles in the narrative and equal opportunities for diverse personalities and interests in order to better reflect the variety of women that exist in the real world. Even if it's unconscious, we wouldn't want to put across the message that most women do or should stay out of career-driven paths to pursue their families, or even that they will always ultimately be the caretaker of the family, and so any career they do choose must come second to it. And most importantly, we don't want to put across the idea by flat-out not including as much time or importance for she-cats and scorning them more harshly for their mistakes when they do get time to themselves that women are ultimately less important or more punishable than men. I will repeat that Warriors doesn't have the worst possible portrayal of gender. Human history doesn't have a great track record with giving equal rights or representation to anyone through a variety of demographics, and we have come a long way already. But there are still underlying biases that contribute to the different roles women are expected to play, the careers they are expected to take, the amount of money they are considered to be worth in the workplace, and the strengths and personality types they are expected to have. Equality for us can't mean not caring or not paying attention to what genders are given what benefits, as that would just leave the opportunity open for more quiet discrimination. For a society with a history like ours, aiming for equality means that we must pay even more attention and be sure that men and women, or toms and she-cats, are given the same opportunities and variability and choices as each other. These biases are deeply ingrained in our world and in us from early childhood, so I'm sure that avoiding them completely in writing is difficult, especially if you're working as part of a team for a company rather than on your own passion project. But at the very least, we should learn to examine the media we consume for biases we might not have expected, and hopefully let that tell us what to avoid when we begin creating our own worlds and teaching the next generation what women, or anyone, can be. And obviously these are grand, lofty, societal goals. What about us, the individual members of a particular fandom for a young adult book series about cats? Well, we as consumers have little to no control over what working partners and HarperCollins put into their books. Other than sending a polite email that may or may not do much, there is one other important thing to do. Just keep an eye out for any negative trends you see popping up and realize when they propagate bad ideas. You don't have to fully condemn warriors or any media you love, but noticing where its faults lie can help you take in only the messages you like from the series. If you do plan on creating your own fanfiction or original series in the future, you'll have a better idea of what did and did not work in other pieces of media to inspire and guide you. This, of course, applies to other issues as well. I covered gender in this video, but there are other issues that have popped up in Warriors, whether through the text or meta-information, such as LGBT inclusion, racial bias, xenophobia, portrayals of disabilities, abusive relationships, and even simpler writing flaws like continuity errors, rushed or skipped character arcs, pacing, and logical flaws in their plots and lore. Looking at all of these with a critical eye is the most important thing to do. Look at where your favorite media falls short, and accept that those flaws exist, rather than blindly assuming the series has no faults or abandoning it altogether. If something you find is a deal-breaker for you, that's fine. No one can or should ever force you to enjoy a book series that upsets you. But it is possible to enjoy Warriors for its characters, world, inspiration, or nostalgic value, and still both see and point out where it is wrong. And for my part, I hope I can continue to do that for you in future, preferably far shorter, videos. Thank you for watching, and always remember to forge a path that you want to pursue. You don't need to listen to expectations of who you ought to be.